Hi friends and welcome to the 39th episode of uh, Matka Chai at the Finer Side. As you all know, the Finer Side is an art gurukul which started after the pandemic began and hopefully at some point of time we are waiting for classes to begin and of course the arts to continue. While we are doing that, the pandemic has had a lot of effect on a lot of people and uh, uh, since I come from an educational background, the highest impacted people are children. And today we have with us Namrata Pai, ma'am. Welcome so much. Thank, thank you so much for uh, accepting and coming on today's show. Thank you so much uh, for uh, being here. Th thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm really glad to be on this platform. Yeah. So uh, just to explain to you, this is uh, agenda-less conversation. We will take it as the way it goes and see how things happen uh, and yeah we are all here eager to learn from you know uh, things from your perspective to understand how things are but before reaching there we want to know about you we want to know mm -hmm. who Namrata Pai is where did she come from what did she do so you can start a good journey from your school till uh, before you started Magpie oh okay um, well it's uh, uh... It's something I think uh, it was never a planned journey. I think things happened uh, along uh, as life moved on. So I basically uh, uh, belong to uh, an army background, as in my father was in the army. So I think I have easily changed around uh, 10 to 12 schools. Uh, and that to my dad was an infantry, which means we were always ready with packed bags <laughs> and ready to yeah. move on. and. Uh, you know, set out on a new adventure. So I guess it was Kendriya Vidyalaya all through. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I'm a Kavian all through and uh, love the fact that uh, I think it gave me a really broad perspective about uh, meeting different kinds of people, uh, you know, classmates, uh, teachers, schools. Uh, so I think that part of it was really good in a way. At the same time, I think um, we just had to manage with whatever was around us and you know um, it just made you really uh, strong and uh, flexible i guess so uh, i and, guess uh, uh, yeah tell me tell me you continue uh, yeah and so i think uh, uh, through this educational journey uh, i i kind of knew that i was not cut out for uh, something which is very mainstream which usually in the indian context can be you know uh, medicine and engineering and right so i think i i knew i wanted to do something different but i wasn't sure what i wanted to do and uh, since my uh, uh mother is from mysore i i had heard about the uh, all indian Institute of speech and hearing and uh, uh you know i thought let me just see what it is and uh, applied and luckily got through and then yeah it just happened so uh where was your college i think k k we finished at 10. that's after right 10? so even after that i was in a kv i did okay. my 11th and 12th also in a kv, a KV. uh in ambala yes uh okay. you know yeah uh in haryana and uh after that i decided okay let me come down south i i think i hardly stayed uh in the south of india it was usually a lot of travel in the east, north, and the west. Wonderful, lovely places to be in, yeah, especially the east and the west. Uh, north, yes, of course, true, true. Uh, def definitely uh, can't say anything about it. But I think the west has so much more uh, greenery, mountains, and people are amazing, and their discipline, sense of discipline is also amazing, is what I believe so. In a few of the cities that I've seen, not everywhere, right. yeah, yes, so. Yes. Uh, uh, KV and jumping from city to city, uh, mm -hmm. would, I look at it in two ways. If you look at the disadvantage, you never had a classmate who's there with you for the 10 years. Mm -hmm. On the other side, if you remember all of them in different cities, you have so many classmates in so many cities. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I think I, I always wish that, you know, we had social media at that point in time. <laughs> because no, no, no. it would be so easy. Believe, <laughs> to me, that, I guess. believe me, we are happy that we didn't have social media at that time. 
<laughs> there is absolutely no proof of what we did which is very good <laughs> absolutely yeah i agree with yeah. that in fact yeah. the best part was doing naughty things in a school and then moving on knowing that you know you're not going to meet that teacher ever <laughs> yeah exactly and also with friends and teenagers there's so much today uh, i mean people are living in social media i mean you know eating what you want to show i don't know whether they eat the same thing that they put up on the pictures uh, the fashion everything is you know that you want to live that life i've also been doing a lot of counseling and talking to youngsters teenagers especially since the last two years after effect uh, there's a lot of worry there's a lot of you know uh, uh, difficulty but that we will come later tell us about your family uh so yeah so uh since uh my dad had to keep moving to places where uh you know families couldn't stay with him and he had to be on duty uh you know a lot of times at the border so it was my mom who was like you know totally in charge of the household you know our education uh you know uh making sure that we are doing things right so um i uh, i think uh, the the onus on the mother uh in a family where you know uh, father is in the forces is really really big so i think she single handedly kind of managed uh, so many things for us i have a couple of friends who uh, are from the army background and i have seen the mothers you know uh, i know a family which don't drink at all the the one in service and his wife but every time they were guests at home she used to take care of them as if she knew the right mixes the food to serve i i understand what you're saying you you are living a different life and you accept that community and be part of it and it's Absolutely. the mother who is doing for the house and the father is there for the nation it's, Absolutely. it's, it's yes. amazing that uh, sharing of responsibility that comes without having to say things and of yes. course the ch yes. children children army children who grow up um, do you ever want to break a rule <laughs> i think uh, i always had a second thought about it uh -huh. and somewhere that whole thing of discipline and punctuality just you know is uh, in your blood yeah. i guess yeah yeah it is yeah <laughs> so I, I, it's really nice to you know ask these questions because you you never thought of it you will never think of breaking it but then yeah it's an it's the nature that you live with and that's how you go by but then it's interesting to find out whether did you even quirkily think about you know too many rules too many uh, punctualities and let me relax and lie down and get up whenever i want right right so i think what happened was um, you know there is this whole image about how uh, just being from the you know forces background or you know everything is really on time and perfect but i guess uh, what happens is that at home you know we are we are a family right and yeah. there are some things which we would do together as a family and where it is not about i mean uh, my parents always gave me the freedom to do uh, you know whatever i want whatever yeah. i want to take up and i think that's why i ended up uh, you know uh, being a speech therapist uh, in some form right because uh, i think i always got the opportunity to uh, think uh, and do things how i want to and i think the confidence also came in because the whole experience of interacting with uh, so many different people just gave you that you know you something will come out of it you know uh, things will go uh, whether they might not be in your uh, hands at that point in time but then you know there's always hope and uh, things um, will turn out uh, for the good and I, i am a strong believer of destiny so i always feel that you know whatever happens is for the good so i think that whole balance i feel it's a mix uh, the discipline along with the you know exposure it kind of just builds you as a person yeah especially when you say exposure I, i'm just thinking imagine uh, you're moving from city to city and you end up meeting so many new children in the camp or in your residence area and each one comes from a different background different language different culture there's so much that you learn without a textbook Absolutely. without going to school and all yeah. those experiences i'm sure today is helping you in uh, when you meet different people to understand them and you know I, i think more than the book knowledge the people knowledge uh, is is very precious 
Absolutely. I think being a speech therapist, uh, communication is a big key, right? It's all all about connecting with people. And somewhere I knew that I like to connect with people. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, how I think this whole thing, as you said, of you know me being with different uh, maybe languages, regions. Um, I, I knew that that's kind of my forte, maybe, right? I can yeah. connect with people. I can blend yeah. myself. or i can join in without making uh, you know being comfortable at the same time yeah, not yeah. being you know too uh, yeah. worried or scared about it so yeah. yeah i think that was the connect which i think finally led me to you know becoming a speech therapist somewhere wonderful so uh, uh, back home uh, who are all there at home now uh so right now um i have a, a 14 year old son so he is uh, you know uh, one part is where he's in a crucial stage maybe in his uh, uh schooling and academics and you know uh, sometimes i always wonder about um he he missed out on this whole uh, shift and movement because i've always been uh, in bangalore uh, from the time he's been born and so you know he's had that steady uh schooling yeah. and steady friends and teachers and stuff uh, i have a pet uh i have my husband so i think yeah uh, uh they are the ones who kind of uh, you know help me uh, stay grounded or uh, feel that you know i can achieve more i think they are my big big support system absolutely family always family always and of course a pet is a huge relief you know uh, true i think some... in the pandemic uh, you know it was such a boon to have a pet yeah and i i had read somewhere saying that if you have teenagers at home get a pet somebody is happy when you come back home <laughs> absolutely <laughs> <laughs> makes sense <laughs> yeah <laughs> because they they fall all over you lick you and the teenagers don't want pda anymore they are done with it you know, exactly yeah. yeah yeah so true, but they, they like that you're there i'm not mentioning that they don't like your back home but that Over bearing, falling over you, that is the pet's job. And yeah, they do it wonderfully well. Okay, done. Now your my sure stint of uh, speech therapy and uh, mm-hmm. learning there, uh, mm-hmm. your mentors, what you learned mm-hmm. there, because I think mm-hmm. from KV when you get into a stage like this, it's totally different. Yeah. Uh, the whole setup is different. Mm-hmm. People are different, and my sure as a city after. living in different places where action is packed suddenly yeah. you're all relaxed true <laughs> very true uh, so one thing is you know uh, uh traveling though we were traveling i was always close to nature uh, you know it was always really green places um really really lovely uh, environment around you so when i joined i think when i the first day of uh, joining um, uh, my college in mysore i think the first thing which really you know i loved was the fact that it was a extremely green place uh, very quiet serene and somewhere i felt that you know oh this is a great place to learn you know it's it's not bustling and you know like a uh, uh, it was just the perfect place and also i think um at that point in time uh, mysore institute also had uh, students from different regions of india so they had these particular seats where you had uh, students from again east west north south so again somewhere there i think i was um, kind of able to connect with a lot of people because of my travel yeah uh, so it made it so much more easier to Please. again um, yeah. have uh, classmates or connect with them on uh, that aspect and the thing i really loved about the you know whole system or the course was we always had half theory half practical okay so it was not like you know you go to the college and um, you know you're just mugging up a lot of theory or there is a lecturer coming in and just you know giving you a lot of information and you're just wondering you know what is this all about because you haven't seen anything in practice but i think we had these uh, um, uh, internships where we would go to hospitals we would do camps uh, around villages uh, around mysore and i think 
that really again told me about how difficult it is at the grassroots in terms of uh, the struggles uh, which generally people have and at the same time families which have maybe a special child or you know difficulty or needs um so i i kind of just felt at home uh the the whole uh, curriculum the way our lecturers made sure that we had some theory and then you know morning theory and afternoon we are trying it out like what what more exciting can it be because uh you have uh, supervisors who would you know kind of maybe guide you through it and um so yeah i i think yeah. i was lucky to be there no well, extremely lucky because uh, the definition of education according to maria montessori is you teach and put them to practice not just teach and forget so which is exactly what you're doing uh, which was amazing that was a wonderful place uh, i hope many institutions are like that where your practical experience is given the same amount of importance as theory okay now coming to magpie how how did magpie happen i'm sure you worked somewhere you worked with children before magpie tell us a little yes bit. yes so um once i uh, finished my course my um uh, uh, father was in uh, mumbai and um, he and since i had done five years in mysore i thought it would be a good change to see go beyond the institute and see how is it to work outside mysore um so uh, the the place was mumbai but then uh, that time it was bombay yeah uh, and uh, um i realized that a lot of established places were looking for experienced therapists so it was all about you know how many years experience do you have and you know then maybe you can send in your resume um so um i decided that let me do some volunteering work because nobody asked for experience there correct um yeah. and so i figured out a couple of uh, places where i could work with children and with adults because speech therapists work with both they work with uh, adults for uh, language issues um, as well as children so uh, i kind of did both there and uh, then somewhere i realized that i love working with the pediatric population and you know that's where my heart is um, so slowly i think uh, i i worked in mumbai for a year and then uh, moved to bangalore and uh, was attached with a couple of uh, you know hospitals for some time um at the same time i just needed a lot of again i think it's my background i needed a lot of freedom in what i do and how i do it and um uh, really wanted to try out things uh, which i felt were really necessary for that family or that child and somewhere um uh, private practice kind of gave me that uh leave it because i could do what i wanted how i wanted and a lot of families who were seeing me uh, did give me feedback saying that they are kind of happy with what i'm doing and started referring in uh, more families because i didn't do any um, advertising and i wasn't really sure because at that point in time there were hardly any uh, centers yeah. private yeah. practices yeah. yes yeah. so it was like you know um, uh new waters and so i decided to you know just see how it goes at the same time i knew that uh, this is something i like i like to work with families i like to work with children and i want to work with the freedom and i want to enjoy uh, what i'm doing okay. wonderful so now is uh, i i never wanted to do a lot of technical stuff with you because i'm sure that every interview people uh, ask you the same things and you must be bored of answering the same things so i thought let's talk about you and you know a lot of things about you uh i i have a couple of parents who are going to be joining us and probably pop in a question or a doubt or an educator there's a chat window that's going on so i'll just pop it here so you can read there are people watching us and they're saying hi shital there is binay there is chinma sharma saying good to know more about you heard a lot as a known speech therapist so there are many more and i have will have some people join us and talk to you also so uh sure. now before we talk about the pandemic and the effects of it mm -hmm. what is your view of government agencies doing mm -hmm. the work that you should be doing or uh, you are doing mm -hmm. because uh, it's not just providing education right 
right? So it's not just setting up a government school and providing education. There is mm-hmm. so much more that happens in uh, with children. It's not giving food Absolutely. only. It's not just giving a uh, good books and uniform. There should be something yes. that they talk about mental health. They talk about children with needs and how are there any government centers, bodies which take care of this? Right. So I think uh, social emotional health has really come in the forefront during the pandemic. But um, it's been, I think, a couple of years since uh, the I think the Delhi government was uh, one of the first ones to kind of look at how it can be included in their curriculum in the government schools. And they have a proper, you know, a textbook uh, with lessons, uh, which go in the order of, you know, um, I like, um, I am an individual, and it's okay to be different. And how can I uh, express myself? Maybe when uh, I'm not feeling that good about things around me. So I think um, uh, this this whole uh, uh, shift towards social emotional uh, learning and supporting it in schools has definitely started. And I know that you know. Uh, even as part of our CBC curriculum, also there are uh, uh, plans of implementing it. Um, I think they already have something which uh, is uh, looking into this aspect uh, of providing counselors who cover this as uh, not only do one is to one counseling with students, but also have it as a curriculum. Um, where they focus on, uh, I think it's called the lifespan approach, if I'm right, because I have uh, one of my colleagues in my team who's worked in a a CBSE school, a speech therapist who's been working in the social emotional learning uh, area. Uh, But yes, it needs to reach out, uh, you know, be more, be a fundamental rather. Uh, Because I think uh, even if you're looking at... uh, big companies are now talking about it's you know they're not going to hire based on uh yeah. you know percentages it's all about uh skills skills right yeah. skills so uh whether it's cooperation collaboration flexibility uh you know i mean i mean executive function or the whole thing of um i need to make sure that i'm in a good space uh, myself and making sure that others around me are also comfortable Right. I think uh, it, it definitely is a focus. Uh, I hope that, you know, it, it, it does pan into something where it becomes mandatory and absolutely compulsory as part of, uh, you know, school curriculums. Okay. Uh, but are there any government bodies doing it? Uh, you spoke about CBSE, but uh-huh. otherwise? Uh, I'm not personally aware of it. Uh, okay. I, I definitely know that as part of their curriculum, they've introduced it uh, in within the CBSC, but yeah. Uh, um, the private practices that there are so many mm-hmm. people who are doing it. Mm-hmm. Uh, see, we, we've run a Montessori school and uh, we've had, I'm sure the same questions I'm sure would have come to you, but probably it'll reach you only after people like us create an alarm for the child or the parent and say, sorry, don't bring the child to us. He needs attention. He needs therapies. Please take them. It's, I think, the first set of people who uh, create this panic are the educators. You know, I'm, I'm blaming myself in this. I'm, I'm telling that we are all like that. We've had parents who came and say, my husband never spoke for six years. What is the hurry for my child to speak? I'm sure you have heard this every year multiple times but absolutely you know, yeah uh, it's so difficult for uh, especially people who come from montessori where we turn around and say don't brand the child don't let the child be he will open up she will open up they will work but over a period of time when we see that over the same child when the alarm is not created goes over at about four and a half, five and becomes even more silent or creates more tension. And then there is this new term that started in the world called early intervention. Hmm. You know, it's it's like a new trailer being released before the film saying that don't send them to the therapies. Start with early intervention. Oh my God. Then you have to learn what early intervention is, get into it and see, okay, 
what methods are there while we were in the montessori they taught us saying that what you're doing is ugly intervention what you're doing is things which probably can be helpful for the child to overcome difficulties because the right. child is working with material the working with sounds and things like that but still i know in many schools many montessori many preschools we have this formula of telling the parent you know actually i think you should see a therapist a uh, moral ethical problem should we do it shouldn't we do it economically the so, economically business solution wonderful money in it hmm. <laughs> you know these are dilemmas these are these are ethical dilemmas but somewhere we know and there is a fear that what if we don't bring in the alarm now will we be blamed later you know i'm i'm sure you work sure. with a lot of uh, uh, educators school owners and i'm sure you have something to talk about this so tell us about this beautiful thing that is started called early intervention right and your sure. views on it um i think uh, this aspect of where uh, families maybe connect with the fact that i spoke late or my husband spoke late culturally it is a part of our upbringing and i i hear it almost every day at the center and i think what has happened is times have really changed from how uh, children were growing up the environment they were growing up in maybe you know even uh, 15 years back 10 years back 5 years back there's a big big change uh, from the time uh, you know uh, tabs and mobiles have really you know become like an extension of ourselves so um that is one aspect definitely where uh, i think we when when we started therapy or we started working with children um i think the earliest age we when we would see or uh, like a four and a half five year old we would be like oh you know this is a young child to work with <laughs> right yeah. and um uh, uh, but what what we didn't realize at that point in time was that you know there was so much more we could have done when the child was younger yeah. and the whole aspect of you know early intervention where you went below 5 and then you said 4 and and now 0 to 0 to 5 is early intervention um, yeah. there are tools which help uh, you know ch- children identify with delays maybe at you know 6 months and 18 months and 24 months which is you know a part of any a developmental pediatrician or a pediatrician's checklist when a child goes for vaccination that okay are you on time for your motor skills and um but somewhere i think uh, when educators come into the picture this definitely one i think a big trust which a parents have with the educator or with the school where they know so there might be a hunch which a parent has that you know there's something missing here because i always feel that they always have that hunch first uh, where they might feel that there's something missing but yes whether it needs attention whether it needs any evaluation that's secondary but they, they do have a hunch about and the first person so if it's not the pediatrician who's you know guided them or told them that you know you can get um Uh, so you can do maybe those milestone checks the milestones absolutely. whether it's being crossed yeah absolutely so they have these checklists which they sh- yeah. uh, which where they should get a tick at 12 and 18 and 24 yeah so the moment it's uh, you know uh, now what happens a lot of times uh, we might again see parents telling that the pediatrician never told me that you know uh, this is a worry they just said he'll catch up and that's where the educator comes in the picture even before the therapist <laughs> because the yeah. child starts with the school <laughs> yeah yeah right uh, and i do get your dilemma of you know whether whether you're going to send them for early intervention or the you know the, your method or system says that let the child be and let him learn at his pace so are we trying to push, put them into a mold and trying to box them up there and saying that they should be doing all of this so i think there um i i strongly believe that if the educator or the system has um, a, a a good maybe um communication with a particular uh, whether it's a center early intervention center or a therapy center or where there is good communication between the educator and them so that in case so when we tell the parents so as educator when you're telling the parent that 
I see, I'm not comparing him and I'm not saying that he should be like this other child I have in my environment, but I know that he can do more or, you know, he has that potential to reach, but there are some things which, you know, uh, might be challenging. What do you think about it? I think just uh, sort of keeping it a little open, uh, okay. see what comes. <laughs> So I, ha I have a, again another uh, question which is going to be bad on me only. Do we okay. really know that the child can do better than what he is doing at three and a half, four? I mean, right. mm -hmm. unknowingly, we are looking at him with 30 children and he yes. stands out. Either he's yes. doing something or not doing something. We see yes. the 29 doing something and then we'll say, oh, this is the problem. Yeah. My teacher is Meenakshi Shivaram Krishna, and she's about 80 plus mm -hmm. now. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. initially, uh, when I took these cases to her and said, Ma'am, what mm -hmm. should I do? Mm -hmm. Simple answer What is your hurry? Mm -hmm. What is your hurry? Are mm -hmm. you in a hurry? Mm -hmm. I mean, MBA must make up. His mm -hmm. child is three and a half, chill. Right, right. Work with the child, use all the material, and see whether mm -hmm. things happen. Now, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But the parent, like you rightly said, intuitively mm -hmm. know something is wrong. Yes. Maybe not by comparison. Intuitively know something. Absolutely. But then when they come to the school, if the school yeah. breaks the news, yes. hell, the hell gets loose. True. True. You are branding uh, my child. Yes, absolutely. I think we, the, the thin line there will be, uh, I think one is you definitely don't want to jump the gun or say that, you know, within a month or two where you're going to, you feel that you're comparing him to maybe 29 more children and saying that, okay, this is where. So I think definitely uh, anything between, you know, around three to four months where you're watching the child and getting to know and then not even telling the parent that you have, you know, labeled him with something or judged him somewhere. Yeah. But telling that, you know, I feel that there is something. What do you feel? And where are you? Do you think you want to uh, get more information about this or check about this? Because I know people who can do this for you. So concurrence rather than judgment. Absolutely. Absolutely. And also the reason I'm mentioning this is because since early intervention talks about zero to five and, you know, I mean, at Magpie, we work with infants as young as six months. And the magic, it's not magic, it's a lot of hard work. <laughs> but yeah. at the same time, the change, the transformation you can get in the child and the family uh, kind of really motivates me to, you know, stress on the fact that if you even have a small red flag, it's okay to consult because it's not a surgery. Yeah. There is no medicine or anything invasive that a therapist might do. Yeah. But I do understand that, you know, you need to make the right choice because since I'm in the whole field of rehab, maybe the check on, uh, you know, being uh, true to what you're doing ethically or checking how good the standards are is something which maybe might not have a very common base platform here. So you don't want to have a bad experience. For your child. So right. I think, yes, it's it's definitely a tricky uh, situation. But at the same time, uh, good to go ahead and not feel guilty maybe later, whether it's the educator or the family. Yeah, I, I, I think it perfectly fine when you say we'll raise little flags in concurrence and not in judgment. Yeah, I hope all educators do that because I don't really see that happening overall. I, I see judgments being passed and I see uh, uh, communication skills in educators. I'm so sorry, but uh, uh, not not everybody is sensitive enough to understand that you're, you're giving something that is going to be uh, labeling and probably emotional distraught to the parents, which will, again, the result of that is the child is going to bear. That anger, the frustration is going to go back on the child. I mean, can't you speak four words properly? 
Why does your teacher have to tell me this? The kind of pressures, I'm only talking from the child's point of view and how difficult it is for that child. Yeah. So, uh, uh, yes, I understand. Early intervention is required as of today uh, because digital invasion earlier than five years has increased so much. I think it's more zero to three years. It's very, very high. Do you see that? Absolutely. I think uh, uh, screens have become, uh, you know, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, pacifiers, babysitters, <laughs> Uh, you know, they, they are taking multiple roles. Yes, absolutely. And especially for the zero to three age group. Yeah. Uh, so that is one. And we have some more people who are saying hi. So let me just pop them up so you can see who they are. I'm sure there are some special educators also here who must be listening. Okay. Waiting for her to talk on how the pandemic has affected toddlers in delayed speech. Do kids born during pandemic need help by default? Wow, interesting question. We'll come to that. Mm -hmm. I have I have a topic uh, on that which uh, I have thought of because it's very important. <clears throat> uh, now, we'll come to the pandemic. This pandemic uh, was good. I mean, a lot of people died, so sorry for them. But uh, otherwise, it was good. We all came down to ground zero. All those who were flying high all came down to one level and said, good to be human, good to be alive, good to see the same people that you saw. And then we were all holed up into one place talking to the same people who we never spoke with. You know, the husband and wife never spoke to each other beyond the required conversation. The child was always ordered to do things. Now he's sitting there. So if the mother doesn't overbearingly engage the child, the father gives dirty looks. After a month of pandemic, they decided you wash, I cook. So you talk when I'm washing. So again, the division of responsibilities increased for both parents. Only person who suffered is the child. Now true, pandemic, almost done. We hope it is done. We never know when it is until the pharma companies decide. We will still be in pandemic, but we hope it is done. And the last six months would have been very challenging for you in terms of people coming more related to pandemic. Yes. Could you tell yes. us your views on how the pandemic probably has affected children? Um. So I think uh, there are maybe a couple of views uh, on my part here. Um, one is that when the pandemic struck, I think a lot of families were actually in a uh, shock in a way because they had never spent uh, so much time together. And as you said, um, having children at home uh, at the same time, if there is some amount of delay, so I'm not saying that they have any, uh, you know, special yeah. needs as such, but just a little bit of delay means uh, a lot of FaceTime and interaction. So when I say FaceTime, I don't, you know, you mean the digital have... FaceTime. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, children between zero to three learn so much through only social interaction, which is being with, uh, it can be, uh, family that is parents grandparents it can be a um, nanny it can be a caretaker it can be uh, you know going to the play area being with other children uh, just going on a you know walk to maybe uh, lalbag or so it, it can be just a walk outside it can be uh, a drive i mean this any opportunity that you get to uh, go out is an opportunity for social interaction and so the moment it was the pandemic, it was a lockdown, which means you are within four walls. Now, within these four walls, what really got cut was the social interaction with outside people. But within the house, since the demand slowly moved to, oh, this is going to stay. So everybody has to work from home and things go as usual. Yeah. So there were uh, parents who were uh, working from home. And they had rooms where, uh, you know, the child was also given uh, a, a 
work from home kind of a role where uh, the screen was basically what engaged the child right and at the same time um this whole screen time which i i'm sure even before the pandemic children were you know watching mobiles or laptops and uh, tabs but the number of hours just went phenomenal from a hour to 10 hours a day now when i said that any opportunity to go out is a social interaction opportunity what i meant was that the child gets to see move watch touch right it's a multi sensory experience yeah now when a child is within four walls with a screen it is definitely a very very uh narrowed down experience with just maybe a lot of visual input which means if the screen is moving with just colors need not have any meaning to it need not have any language associated with it and still the child will be glued to it yeah there were also children where uh, parents <coughs> told me that they just had to have the tv on it's not that the child is watching so i'm okay with it mm. so automatically whether it is active viewing or passive right it's still heavy screen time and uh, we, there are norms which talk about how below 2 your screen time needs to be maybe uh, you know zero that's nothing at all so this whole input i think is what made uh, children really anxious about social interactions which means even a doorbell can sound anx- can be anxiety provoking for a child because nobody rang the bell for so many days and months yeah got it yeah and and apartments they were allowed children to come out That's absolutely so no play time ever. yeah no play yeah. time and yes. Uh, yes. you couldn't even sneak into your friend's house from Very a floor true. to a floor yes and all, there was so much you know if, so yeah. yeah and people were hold up with you know windows closed i mean i've yeah. come i've come across families where they said they didn't want to even open the balcony because they they were worried about the virus right i had families where a uh, father and mother were uh, you know down with covid taking turns and they had this small child to care for with no help right so the whole interaction which the child should have had with family outside i think everything has really affected um and this this part is for families where as i said maybe the needs or the uh, reasons were where maybe the child would have had a okay development otherwise but what about families where they were already having a child with needs or yeah. you know exactly. where they the how would they was already been given yeah absolutely and i think in in, in those cases uh, i think it was a mixed kind of uh, i have a you know mixed uh, feedback from parents where for some they really felt that they got a lot of time to connect because things were always moving they were you know traveling uh, whether it was work and you know they wouldn't know when we can came and went right uh, for so for some families it was really motivating for them to uh, they felt they got the time they could connect they could teach the child so many life skills yeah right because i think it's more than just uh, you know knowing uh, academic or very you know names of things of which a child can rattle off i think having functional skills like you know i maybe uh, uh, watering plants right or uh, putting clothes for drying right so I you, mean, you just spoke about biology and physics mm-hmm. why do you need online classes absolutely that's another point i'll make later because i'm very <laughs> vehemently angry with all the educators who created mm-hmm. online classes the damage mm-hmm. is irreparable mm-hmm. but anyway i'm going to bring in a, a parent and an educator and uh, she has a question kaushal is here yes can you hear yes i can hear you am i audible yeah please go ahead yes yeah. hi namrata uh, hi kaushal uh, hi i don't know if you remember me but you have visited my montessori house of children it's called samanwar i do absolutely uh, yeah you yeah. do okay all right uh, so 
just going back to the few of the things that uh, we have been talking about about uh, even like uh, you know the early intervention that you uh, that uh, that you guys touched upon and um, now the pandemic right about it being a boon for some families but also a complete source of stress for many others i think uh, the boon uh, for, I think the minority would be the families which consider it a boon that they kind of slowed down and had time for a lot of other things. Um, also coming to um, how the pandemic affected children in this age group, like the zero to five. Um, and I think like how Krutvi was saying, uh, yes, we uh, educators did, uh, I think we, we do tend to be a little alarmist um so at at the age of like say three three and a half if the child is completely silent uh yes i myself have recommended a couple of parents to come to um magpie uh because we don't want to wait to see for how uh, how much longer would it take right um but also we have so in a mix of now if i look at the community of children that we have at our uh, uh montessori uh, nearly 50%, I think, of the children, we can definitely see the effect um, of not having these social interactions, uh, the emotional uh, development that could have happened because of the various interactions, um, being, an, uh, being exposed to different environments, right? But when, at what point, like, say, if we see um, when, when, Children are talking, but it's not clear the speech. Um, so you have a hard time understanding them. One of the things could be that the mask is also sometimes in the way. So, uh, but, but once the mask is down, we say, okay, could you repeat? And still we are not able to understand. There's a little bit of a lisp, or there are a few sounds that the child is repeatedly four and four and a half, I'm talking about this age group. Do we still wait or do we do some special exercises? Because the thing is, we don't have that um, the specialist knowledge. We are, we are here with the, uh, with the training in Montessori and whatever other experience we might have picked up over the years. But like the specialist knowledge, like do we, the child is four, four and a half. We have a, a you know, couple of children who have trouble articulating um, and being understood by others. So do we still wait? Like, that's the thing, the cultural thing, right? That, okay, let us wait and see. Or, I mean, like, yeah, our, what is the hurry? But still, on the other hand, it's it's a little bit of a dilemma. So what sure, do you sure. suggest? So how I would put this is, whenever a child is learning, um, there are two things which are developing. One is the uh, quality of speech and one is the quantity of speech, right? Quantity can be in terms of words and sentences and narration and storytelling, while quality can be in terms of the clarity, right? And they go hand in hand. So if the child is picking up on quantity, when I say quantity, I mean usually now as times have changed in the past five years, the milestones have actually become faster, which means children are picking up vocabulary really, really soon now. Right. And so we usually say how much ever slow the child is, he should be having around, uh, you know, 50 words by two years of age. Five zero. OK. And when I say 50 words, I don't mean that, you know, it's about names of cities and capitals and flags and countries. I mean, 50 words which are functionally used, right? Like come, give, open, let's go, bye bye, hello. Right. These are social interaction words. And so we are looking at at least 50 words because then we know that the clarity for speech would really set in by the time the child is maybe three, three and a half, because he would have picked up a lot of the basic sounds, whether it's pa, ba, ma, ka, ga. So most of them are in terms of uh, producing that. And if these milestones are going on at par, 
with age by four a child is 80 percent 80 to 90 percent very intelligible which means a neighbor can understand you know a stranger can understand right so if this mark of what i said maybe 50 words by two years of age was not hit at that point in time maybe the child was a slow talker right and he didn't uh, maybe take therapy and somewhere along the line he caught up the question is did he catch up because it might look like he caught up and that's where maybe the professional uh, or a speech therapist comes into the picture to figure out oh is this child uh, as per age in quality and quantity both so i think that would be one aspect the second aspect would be as an educator if 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 you feel that uh, you are struggling with maybe phonics or you know specific areas with this child who has clarity issues i think working on a lot of just perception first that is whether the child is able to figure out you know what's right and what's different is he able to at least understand it rather than producing it because i think that part definitely best left to uh, the professional which would be the speech therapist to figure out is the child not clear because he doesn't know the rules of the language versus is it because he has some structural issue which needs to be looked into So yeah, I think the, uh, there's a lot of self-awareness in the children that I'm dealing with, at least. Mm -hmm. um, when when they say that I know what this sound is, mm -hmm. but I'm not able to say it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that that awareness seems to be there on part of the uh, the the couple of children that I'm working with. Uh, so we just wait uh, it out. Sorry, sorry, Kaushal, just to add, because I think this is a very important point here. So the reason also why we want to see these children being sent to a specialist is because just like how milestones have come up earlier, awareness that this child is different between peer group has also come up, which means it, the, these children can get teased Mm. Or bullied, or bullied. Okay. just because of this, okay. for no fault of the child. No of the child. Mm. Oh, it gets so complicated. Prithvi, I think you're muted. I, I did it so that the echoes don't come by. So, thank you, thank you, Kaushal. This is a topic which we will do another two hours easily. But <laughs> since this is a show where we would like to wind up also, let us say thank you for your question. I'm sure there's more that you have to learn from uh, people like Namrata. And I think while we work with children, we learn every day. I think we learn more than what they learn. So all the best to Saman Vai, all the best to all the children there. And I'm sure you can reach out to everyone here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a uh, this is an area where you you will have hundred questions. There's one more here. Do you think a child, say three to four years old, unable to speak, can amidst other children in school goes through anxiety? Kavita, I will only give the answer. Yes, Baba, hundred <laughs> percent. Now she will add in. <laughs> I think Abhrithvi is saying, you know, also the fact that you mentioned this example about how, uh, you know, uh, the parent might blame the child, right? You're not even able to say this much, right? Like, yeah. why, why, is it, why is it that you're struggling? I yeah. think this is where parents really need to understand about how uh, this anxiety which the child might have because of the fact that he's not able to communicate can actually be handled with the help of a professional rather than blaming the child or blaming of the yourself as a parent absolutely because absolutely. this whole guilt trip really affects the child so much and finally the family and they don't have any energy then actually to have that bond or you know look beyond it yeah very true so uh, uh could you add to Kar uh, kavita's question no i only said okay. one word so <laughs> oh sure yeah yeah so i think uh, every time a child is not able to express uh, you know, his feelings or his thoughts, 
just imagine yourself if you want to say something but you don't have the right words for it or you're not able to convey it to the other person you will face a lot of uh, rejection now not knowingly it's not that somebody's going to uh, not look at you but every time the child attempts he might not get the response he was looking for unknowingly knowingly either it can be from adults it can be from peers and so every time you face a failure what happens right every time you face a failure you feel there's something wrong with you yeah. right and so even a 3 year old or a 4 year old can actually sense that this is really hard for me and nobody's making it easy for me so how do i express myself which means automatically their ways of expression go beyond communication through speech it might be that you know they're crying they're screaming they're trying to communicate they definitely have a reason for it but then if we don't support them the right way it 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 yeah. would look like communication which is really difficult to understand yeah, yeah. so one more question is here what kind of assertions and tools can be used by the parent to deal with this anxiety of the child mm -hmm. um i think in terms of assertions and tools the more you are able to tell the child or appreciate the child for what he does however small it is is really really important and involving the child in your day to day activities where he feels that he has a role he's important there i think small things like this can really go a long way in building the child's uh, you know relationship or attachment with you because as parents we always want to do something really good for our child so no parent ever wants to hurt his child or their feelings at the same time the way we it just comes naturally to us we always see the negative first Yeah. we are ready to jump in with criticism or say oh, this is not how you do it stop 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 right but how many times do we actually appreciate the child when he did it right or appreciate him for doing however small it is but being a part of uh, you know what you're doing or what maybe he's drawing or you know he kept something for you he got something for you it's it's really important to appreciate the good things i think that's something we always forget yeah absolutely absolutely so as tools i think it's more communication more uh, not giving digital being there for the child like she said just walk in your basement and name the cars more than enough you don't need to do anything uh, yeah so being, uh, being in the moment with your child i think that's so yeah. important <laughs> yeah so i was telling you that you know i have vehemently i was against uh, these online school that began and uh, the reason is suddenly one day i was sitting and talking to somebody in a village somewhere had gone for a shoot and they didn't have any online class and the parents said we can't do afford anything so you know i think he goes to the school so believe me the child was much more educated because he didn't have an online class he mm -hmm. did a lot of farming not necessary that if you are in bangalore there is no farm no there are so many other things that you could do so i came back sat and thought and said can you believe if only all we educators would not have done online class imagine the amount of learning for the child they would have spent time with grandparents understood them emotionally because usually going to school coming back fleet of a time also watch tv do homework study now you had more time in hand you never know probably pick up a book and flip the page read talk communicate cook so many things and uh, if educators need there's history geography literature science chemistry biology uh, physical education every area of what you do in the school is there in that including art and craft so why did we not do that and why did we increase this uh, uh, i'm going to say it in a very different way revenue stream for mm -hmm. special educators in the next 4 years mm -hmm. because you're going to see a huge number of children gap with gaps coming yes and you are not going to get sleep for the next 3 years uh, namrata it's going to be packed absolutely i am i from the time uh, things have you know started bouncing back uh, we can already see how children have been part of online schools without being acknowledged at all in a classroom right yeah. and so 
schools definitely start the first thing is the social bond the child has right with the classmates or with the teacher and so i think that one part missing the other being as you mentioned in terms of learnings yes definitely i think we are going to see this for the next 4 to 5 years for sure yeah. um we all are you know going to be busy at the same time i think uh, somewhere this whole transition also happened because uh, i'm sure one part was the education system but the other part was also where parents wanted the child to be into something which was like engage them <laughs> yes. because i can't engage them so the school should engage them yeah engage them yeah yeah very very bad so uh, there was a question earlier from sheetal so uh, do kids born during pandemic need help by default mm -hmm. um i would just put it by saying that children are really very very resilient they learn so much in very short time with their experiences so i wouldn't want to just say that every child in the pandemic is going to have a lot of difficulties so we definitely can't have that blanket uh, statement at the same time we definitely need to keep in mind that the exposure and the kind of uh, anxiety all families have gone through we really need to uh, you know keep that in mind and have that in somewhere in the background uh, to understand that if my child is struggling in some area i really need to uh, you know figure out and support them it's not fix them i'm not saying fix them and you know yeah, yeah. make them <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what they are not <laughs> repair them yes yeah. absolutely yeah. terms i tell you so uh, uh, uh sheetal don't worry if the child is born during pandemic you are the most luckiest mother and the child is the most luckiest child because both the parents have been with the child all through and through two years two and a half he'll go to school he'll be perfectly normal enjoy the life Yeah, Absolutely. for those children who are born 2018, 19, you know where Magpie is, and uh, you, if the child has been exposed to too much of digital, yes, look for signals. Make sure that the child is more comfortable emotionally, and don't let them down now. Don't yes, demand be there. Be there right? for them. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely, be there for them. Be their pillars. Uh, support them. and uh, you know work work on having that uh, it's not about you know uh, any kind of a diagnosis or a label just making our children independent thinkers and confident and happy and happy yes so it is so so much important to uh, for us to us to remodel ourselves in terms of our expectations with children uh, in terms of what we ask demand and push you know yes so the best place to understand push is a skating rink you know i am sure yeah, yeah. all of us have tried putting our children into the skating rink and after he fell three times he turned around and said do you know i like to play the tabla better not do this we'll never understand that you know so for us it is to push and do something but is yes, there so much of expectation i usually do this for an hour and it's already crossed the hour and uh, <laughs> if you're not in a hurry i'm going to ask uh, people if they have any questions so mm -hmm. that they can pop it up now sure there is appreciation so very important to read appreciations yeah we all need our motivation yeah <laughs> thank you thank you from lippy tiles uh, wonderful uh, uh, i like i met this girl this morning and uh, a uh, very interesting that she uh, was diagnosed dyslexic and she overcome a lot of things and her parents supported her the right way and she is now manufacturing these tools to make sure that language uh, different languages are reaching different people amazing amazing so hats off to such uh, achievers and you know it's the support that happens yeah uh, apart from that uh, i also want to announce to everybody today tomorrow at rangashankara there is a play called mad hatters tea party which is all about mental health it's all about mental mm -hmm. health and two people living in one person's mind and how uh, they go berserk and what happens uh, including you please i'm inviting you especially to come and 
see it so that we understand children. And I, what I liked is this story was written by a 19, 20 year old girl and mm -hmm. directed. Very, oh, wow. very well done. So all mm -hmm. the students are part of it, Christ College, many of them. So please, all friends, if you have the time, Rangashankara, 7.30 tomorrow. Yeah. App for so, today's times. Everybody yeah. should watch it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, nice. I don't see any questions coming up. So uh, I thank you so much for uh, coming today. If you have anything else to say, please go ahead. Uh, well, I, I would just, you know, uh, end it by saying um, I, I, I have never uh, just believed in the wait and watch. That is, we're just going to wait, 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 because I feel it's always about the child. And I don't want children coming to us, uh, you know, damaged in terms of their self-esteem in any form. So um, seek out help. You if you're stressed out, you have uh, difficulties with the child's communication, you are not able to connect with your child, um, whether it's socially, emotionally, I think you should seek help. And then especially in today's times, um, it's it's so important so that uh, we, we have children who are, as I said, um, confident, happy and independent. Yeah. And it's easier to work with them, right? Absolutely. So we have another... Okay. I'm a new name today. I'm called Prothvi, so <laughs> I'm towards the east. The east, <laughs> <of> yeah. <India. laughs> so it's nice to see humor in all these things. It's good fun. Yeah. Uh, one last question uh, mm -hmm. for parents who are listening. Yeah. The educators do these alarms. Uh, the parents have intuitively, uh, no, probably understand that there is something. Before reaching you, you said 50 words is what they should look at. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Could that be a scale even for a parent to look at? Absolutely, yes. yes. So the reason I've mentioned 50 is because the slowest of talkers, and you can keep all of your family history also with it, but still the slowest of talkers, if they're not using 50 words by um, two years of age, then there's definitely something missing. Now, it, it doesn't mean that it's something major. It doesn't mean that you have to label your child it might be that you just have to make some small lifestyle changes. It's not about just looking at something, looking at the worst case scenario, but always good to seek help so that your child is able to, you know, uh, connect with people around him. Okay. So one last uh, crazy question before coming to you, do parents do Google and get a lot of information and come and give you information? I, I, I every, every, so Saturday is when I meet all my new parents. Okay, you know, new families who come and meet me, and yeah. I always have so much to learn from them. And I'm saying it in a good way as well. At the same time, sometimes it can be, uh, you know, too much of uh, Google knowledge. Yeah. yeah, too much of Google knowledge. Yeah. So as 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 we say, the internet is good and bad. So it is also confusing. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Thank you so much for taking time out, spending time talking to all of us. Hey, Silesh, don't worry. Good. He's very worried. He's saying, sorry, typing mistake. Chill. Don't worry. Enjoy. Yeah. So, yes, thank you so much for uh, spending this time. We really wanted to know uh, uh, things about, are we okay, comfortable to live and do we really need to brand? Um, yes, you've thrown a lot of light in terms of what early intervention is, basically, because many of us thought it's very new and we are branding. But you said that there are children as early as six months, which means that, yes, it's possible to identify early and rectify early, which is such a, such a boon for the child. Uh, that is one. Two, in terms of uh, tips for educators, parents to learn, do at home, very important. Thank you for that too. And uh, uh, could you just tell us where your uh, setup is so that our parents know if in case they have to reach you. I know Google is there and they get all information, but still we would like to hear from. So uh, Magpie Speech Therapy is uh, located in uh, JP Nagar 7th phase in Bangalore. We have uh, uh, two offices there just next to each other. And that's the only Magpie uh, office in the uh, whole of Bangalore. 
and uh, we are a completely a uh, pediatric center which means uh, we see only children uh, at the same time we see children for uh, speech uh, issues for language for social emotional uh, uh, challenges as well as for feeding so i think these are different areas uh, we work with and our philosophy is a lot on uh, accepting the child where he is and not trying to change too many too many things in him but understanding what we need to change in ourselves to understand him better so and our tagline is you don't have to be perfect to be amazing wonderful thank you thank you so much and it was so lovely talking to you so we wind up this special month of women which we did who are different artists Thank you, Prithvi. Thank you for having me here, and it was a pleasure and uh, a really fun conversation. As you mentioned, that you know, a lot of times I'm only asked uh, speech therapy-related uh, uh, questions, so this was a welcome change. Thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. Yeah. So before we all leave, uh, mandatory marketing activity. I will put uh, a, a small video of what the finer side is. I wish you all to see it, and then we will say bye.